episode 001, Brett Regan, David Brickley, co-owners of STN Digital. Mr. Regan, let's get started. Yeah, man, uh, before we get into it, I've got to hear about how Halloween went. I specifically didn't ask you this morning because I'd love to hear on air. Um, you, had a, you had a bit of a, a weak voice this morning, yeah, when, a little went raspy. Out, went out in downtown San Diego. We paid, bad idea, uh, $55 for like the monster bass. Okay. And where they, they shut off like a few blocks of downtown. And, I, drove, um, I drove by it. Yeah, we pretty much walked right through it in 13 minutes, and that was uh, went to a bar outside of it. So they have the, they have like these tables and they have drinks, but you're paying 13 dollars a drink anyway when you're in there. So there wasn't there was stages and there was like big people walking around on stilts, but not 55 dollars worth. Yeah, seems like one of those deals where you're paying for the opportunity to drink outside, yeah, which is exactly. nice in San Diego, <laughs> but it's probably not worth the extra money. Yeah, uh, how about yourself? Uh, I ran a half marathon oh, on okay. Saturday. How'd that go? Super last minute. It went better than my last one. Last one, the end result was injury. I did finish the last one before this. Half marathon. Yes. So I did. A, this was a half marathon, my second half marathon in the series, but I finished like 15 minutes better, but nice. I was being passed by people who... It, Once was a again, good, it was a good don't judge a book by its cover because I was getting passed by people that it looked like I should have beat. Once again, absolutely no training. No training at all. Actually, I... Uh, didn't I wasn't registered for the race. I set my alarm and then made a judgment call the morning of. What is that about? Went out there. That's and like a weird it. thing, like a weird hole you're trying to fill. And I'm uh... <laughs> terrified of commitment. That's what it is. Clearly. Uh, all right, so let's jump into the first topic, the relevant business news that we want to discuss on today's show. And last week was big. Twitter shut down Vine. We know back in 2012, they bought it for $30 million. Four years later, they shut it down completely. And this was this was big. One of the major, I know Twitter owned it, but one of the major networks, social networks that have fallen as of late. And it was producing a lot of talent. Whether you like what they were doing or not is another story, but there were a lot of people that were considered Vine stars that were making a lot of money. That was their primary vehicle of views for a lot of the sponsorship that they were doing. Um, some people will be around long after Vine, but I think this could be a death blow for a lot of those. So someone artists. like King Batch, who we all know, he had over 6 billion loops, 16 million followers on Vine. Sure. And we talked about the, when it first dropped, you know, how, how terrible would it be is if that's how you made your money as a Vine star. A lot of these guys did a good job of diversifying their audience, but this also is, is a great business tip or, you know, an influencer tip. If you're big on one of these networks, your immediate goal should be to push all your fans to YouTube, Snapchat, Facebook, Instagram, Absolutely. because if there's anybody out there that had a million followers and was only a Vine star, <laughs> all of a sudden they shut down your primary source of income. Sure, and there were a few examples of people that I thought were talented, and no matter what the medium, they would have been able to do right. pretty well, and they took advantage of Vine as one of the platforms. So King Batch, he'll have a career. Yep. If Vine didn't exist, he probably would have had some sort of career in social. Matt Cutshaw, I think, is up there as well. Yep. But there were some people who really dug into just that platform, figured out how to make interesting videos based on the fact that it's only six seconds, only looping. For those, it's going to be very difficult to really expand outside of Vine. Yeah, and when you talk about trying to get uh, money for being an influencer, you know, King Batch, he has 10.5 million on Instagram now, 1 million on YouTube, 8.4 million on Facebook but he had 16 million on Vine that was his number one you know follower base and now that's cut all the way down so sure. you know when he was approaching branch he's saying 16 plus 10 and a half plus one plus eight and now he has to cut off that a whole that whole top of it so like you said he's done well but talk about how important it is diversify right. your audience and it does seem like that was the primary driver to the other social feeds is that he was found on Vine because he you know everybody shared everything he ever did so you would be introduced to him from Vine and then be pushed to the other platforms. Now, if he doesn't have that initial feeder, uh, are people going to seek him out? And, I don't know. And dissecting Vine in itself as a business model just refused to innovate, I guess. I mean, when Instagram came out with video, I felt like that was the last straw. And over the last you know year to 18 months, there's nothing really new on the platform and never really made it. And, you know, that's you know, it became popular lingo, do it for the vine. I mean, this was a really big platform that everybody knew. It was knew. cultural. Yeah, it was cultural. And, um, you know, it, it tells you, you know, you can be the hottest thing on the street, but if you don't innovate for 12 or 18 months, you could have to shut down because it's now cost too much to operate. Sure. This is also the result of getting users at any cost 
type model, eventually it may be so clear that there's absolutely no way to profit from it, even though it seems from the outside that you've got yeah. a really great thing going, you got all these people, there's all this talent, it's a really awesome community that's very devoted, not enough to make any money, and in the end, if it's leaking money from a larger company and it's public, shareholders are going to want you to cut Yeah, it. one of the, the reasons Vine failed is because they had the King Batches that we talked about and, and the guys up top that made really good content. You would go on there and scroll, but... You didn't really feel the need as a, as a consumer to post yourself. And that's where I think Snapchat and Instagram had them beat was everybody wants to post their own things. On Vine, it was almost like a TV channel that you flipped on and you would watch once in a while. But as far as a peer-to-peer -peer network, nobody was really posting outside of the, the top Viners. Right. And in terms of acquisitions from media or social, if you don't have a long-term plan, it's probably a bad idea to buy something. Um, Facebook bought... What was it? Instagram. I, no, what was the, the messenger app? Oh, uh, what, WhatsApp. WhatsApp yeah. for $19 billion right. or something absurd. But they turned it into a Facebook product pretty quickly yep. uh, without trying to alienate the audience. But now it's you know it doesn't look like WhatsApp. If you were a WhatsApp person before, you're now a messenger person. Yeah, that's true. And Vine didn't do that. They never rebranded as Twitter. It was always they, two separate products, too. For whatever right. reason, they didn't. You'd think Vine would just be absorbed by Twitter, and it would be really easy to post those six-second looping videos within the Twitter native app. But they made them so separate that you didn't right. even know Twitter owned it. And even it. now... It doesn't have to be a separate product. You'd think because they own the IP that they could just pull all that over and have it be an option on Twitter, but uh, it looks like that's not the case from anything I've read. All right, so we'll move on to our second topic, what we learned this week as entrepreneurs. I'll throw it to you first. Well, I want to say my business news. Okay. I got oh, a, I got you a have your piece. own business. I, I thought this was uh, okay. Okay, so I've got Back a little piece of business news. We're still getting things situated here. This is our uh, first one out of pilot. Uh, but the business news that I found really interesting this week is Tesla – dropped an announcement about their new solar roof panels. And what was really interesting about this is, if you've ever seen solar panels, they look terrible. The reason that people don't buy them is because they're huge. Oh, they're expensive. Uh, they're, but, I mean, they just look shitty. If you have a big, beautiful home and you want to save, you'll really ruin your nice terracotta tile yeah. if you pile those big things up there. They just look very utilitarian, not very beautiful. Um, Tesla has now introduced really nice glass tiles that look just about as beautiful as um, any other roof tile. So the announcement was made in kind of a cool setting. He brought a bunch of people out to Hollywood on the set where they filmed Desperate Housewives, I believe, okay. and had a little presentation in the middle of the neighborhood. Midway through the presentation, uh, he mentioned, hey, do you notice anything about these homes? And showed that they all had these new glass tiles. Uh, really impressive stuff. I So I'm looking at it right now. Essentially, it looks exactly like a roof. High end. Yeah, so each so each tile now has that solar capability that's wired right. inside and, the house. And I don't even want to pretend to know about the technology, but Tesla's that's been pushing cool. batteries for a long time that can live in your garage. No one really understood the application or how that was going to go there. Um, but it looks to me like they're trying to push this. They say beautiful, affordable, and seamlessly integrated, meaning that uh, the way that he projected was like if it's affordable it looks great and it can be integrated why really easily it, why yeah. wouldn't you wind up doing it um so i look at him as kind of not a mentor but somebody i look up to because he's kind of an edison of our day but yes. he he really does a good job of solving global problems problems that aren't just going to go and away honestly i feel like everybody looks at him as tesla as the cars but that's just a vehicle both as a metaphor and, and literally for the batteries. I mean, I think the battery right. is something that he's been focusing on with a lot of his products. And think of one other thought leader in the space of, you know, renewable energies, new energies, electric cars. He's the one guy who's doing both of these in a couple other areas as well as trying to go to Mars. He's pretty, pretty impressive guy. You know, what I just saw, I was just looking at a video right now too. It looks like with normal tiles, if you dropped like a, something on it, it would break, and yes. these don't break either. Right, so that's, <laughs> that's, that's, cool. a, that's a big problem in a lot of areas, not so much in San Diego, but in uh, more alpine areas. I used to live in Tahoe, okay. and acorns would fall oh, yeah. and break $40 you know, beautiful tile roofs, yeah. and they had to replace them frequently. So uh, the, the thought that they don't break easily, they're durable, affordable, all that. Um, if I was building a new home, I would that's dope. definitely look into that. So. Um, what I pulled from that, which we're trying to pull from these stores, is that uh, he does a really good job of diversifying his portfolio yeah. into a lot of different areas uh, and looking to fix global problems that affect a lot of people, not just a narrow focus. So 
uh, that was interesting to me. Very cool. Uh, so let's now move on to what we learned this week as entrepreneurs. Uh, I'll throw it to you first. So this is something that you and I say all the time in different applications, but clients are going to tell you what's wrong with your business. Yep. Uh, and we had a little bit of an interesting week last week where we spoke to a client and it was really a, a really sincere glowing recommendation um, where, you know, he basically just said he really, you know, liked working with us and it was a great relationship and couldn't wait to work with us again. And I was on a high because I take those kind of things really personally. Yep. And it's like the best thing that I can hear from anybody. Organically too. You're not asking like, Hey, do, do you like, no, us? this was, was just yeah. like a, a normal kind of chit chat call. And, um, it basically just, you know, had super positive vibe afterwards. Yep. And I felt like, Hey, we're doing something right. And I two hours <laughs> later, I know where you're going with this. two hours later, we had a similar call and I was really stunned and I got some negative feedback from right. a client on something. Right. And it really threw me for a loop because I take the bad stuff more yep. personally than the good stuff. Of course. So it went from this little roller coaster. But the, the, the way to do that uh, and to, you know, what I want to take from that is to look at both of those situations and find out why one client felt the way that they did versus the other client. Um, do a no-fault autopsy and figure out a way that both clients moving forward can feel the same way and be super positive. And the worst part about it was the client that was having issues generally mm -hmm. is the same type of person who would give those really glowing recommendations. We used right. to joke on the phone uh, that we would hear them sometimes just like, you know, talking about how great we were for the first two minutes of the call right. and then lead into it. Um, so to hear that from that particular client um, was a red flag, A, but it's also something where always listen to your clients when somebody's got well, something I, negative I, to say. I think to piggyback off that a little bit too, I think what we've learned the last couple of months with clients is if anything is somewhat awkward in email, like if something gets brought up and you can tell there's a little, not anger, but you can tell there's a little bit of hesitation on behalf of the client, get on a phone. Like uh, there's, there's no way for a bunch of email chains to not feel passive. Exactly. And with email, you know, what do they say? 90% of communications, you know, nonverbal, but it's so hard to dictate tone and you don't know if someone's like, it would be nice if you guys did this or ha ha, it'd be nice if you guys did this for me. You know what I mean? Yep. So it's really hard without wink faces and emojis to convey what you're trying to say. So I think if there's ever like, oh really? I didn't know that's how you guys do things. Like let's just hop on a quick call. Cause I think right. you can get all of it done in three minutes opposed to 14 emails back and forth. Yeah. And no matter who the client is, if somebody's totally unreasonable, there's, there, there's no rule that says that you have to bend over and, yeah. you know, do something that's not good for your company. But at the same time, uh, having a one-to-one -one communication in almost every circumstance, personally and yeah, professionally, every, every if, you, if you have yeah. a reasonable conversation, you can usually find a common ground and get to a, an answer that everybody's happy with, and then they forget about the whole yeah, thing. Yeah, if your girlfriend and you know. wife are storming around not talking to you all day, at the end of the day, like, what's going on? Like, what do yeah. I do? <laughs> right. Let's and talk as long, Yeah, and as long as you're I'm not, not overly stubborn, yeah. yeah, I mean, there's you're not going to change your life necessarily, right. but most cases... Um, there's just a quick misunderstanding that can be kind of worked over. One epiphany I had this week is really um, that not a lot has changed since high school. And what I mean by that is, you know, we all remember in high school and even in college to a certain extent that you would be put in group projects and there would be, you know, six to eight people in this group and you guys would have to do a presentation. And, you know, three people didn't really want to do anything. Two people didn't really speak up. And I felt, at least for me, I was always a person like, all right, guys, I'm going to do this. You do that. You do this. Let's all get back together tomorrow at two and see where we're at. And, you know, even as we go into business and you work with different vendors and you work with different clients, uh, being on location for a project last week, I it kind of felt like a group project again because you got security, you got a vendor here, you got another a sponsorship here, you got the client over here, and someone has to take charge. Someone has to say, all right, guys, so here's a plan. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of business owners feel like they don't want to step on anybody's toes. You don't want to be the abrasive guy that says, we're doing this, shut up, I'm, I'm calling the shots, Donald Trump-esque. But uh, I think sometimes you just have to go in there and say, hey, guys, I don't want to step on anybody's toes, but here's what we have to do to get the job done. And I think you would agree, a lot of our clients really enjoy that about us is, you know, not to, you know, pat ourselves on the back too much, but we say, hey, this is how we're going to do it. We're going to plan. It's going to go like this. And then we do execute it the way we said we were going to do it. Sure. And then it's like, wow, because a lot of people, especially in L.A. and different agencies out there, uh, they talk a lot about strategy and what they're going to do, but necessarily don't get it done. Sure. And if you go into a situation where there is somebody who's already in charge, there's no point in fighting them if they're doing their job. But when there's a power but vacuum like, and everyone's ah, waiting yeah. around for someone yeah. to just give them direction, 
Uh, it's really not being bossy, but even being on sets where there's, you know, actors, if you ask somebody to do something, a humans, lot of times man. they, yeah. they want to be told what to do because they're in that position. Right. Everybody's there. They're ready to go. Let me know what I can do. Actors want to be directed. Process. That's why they have directors. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I agree. I think, you know, there's there's a big difference between um, being egotistical and bossy and then taking charge of a situation I think people, so you get the end result that everyone's And I think with. people are handicapped by that, like, you know, almost the same way, you know, guys, since the beginning of time, approaching a woman, an attractive woman, you say, I don't know, what if she doesn't like me? What if she has a boyfriend? What if she has a husband already? Sometimes you just got to go up there and say, how you doing? And I think in business situations, you also have to, you know, if everybody's just sitting there and there's an awkward moment, like, hey, all right, guys, so this is what I think we should do. Let me know if I'm not stepping on anybody's toes, but I'm going to do A, B, and C now. All good? Good. Let's move forward. So. Yep. Most people like progress, and that's the where you get to it. All right, moving on to what we're reading. I'll start this one off. Um, Seth Gooden, who wrote one of my favorite books, The Dip. I don't know if I ever gave that to you. Um, but essentially, when knowing when it's simply just a dip or knowing when you need to just turn around and go the other direction when it comes to business and life and relationships. But I subscribed to his daily newsletter, and when I thought about this topic, uh, it's something that it gets in my inbox like every morning at 3.30 in the morning, but always drops a lot of knowledge and I think uh, gives you a lot of good advice on everything on business. So anybody out there that's looking for a daily newsletter in their email, if a little pick-me-up in the morning, I highly recommend Seth Good. And so this is an email newsletter that comes in. How, yep. do, you, how do you get to that? Uh, I think he has a blog, Seth Gooden. You can just search for Google, but SethGooden.com. Um, you can... I saw... I think he was on... Uh, I forgot what podcast he was on, but he talked about it. I subscribed right away and I just... I didn't really realize it, but I do read it every morning. And, you know, four out of the five times is pretty good knowledge there. Oh, cool. yeah. And I believe he does have a podcast that he does weeklies on as well. Yep. Um, so I will go into what I'm reading now. The book is called Powerhouse, The Untold Story of Hollywood's Creative Artist Agency. Um, CAA. CAA. So I didn't know much about CAA beforehand. Um, one of our previous clients who left uh, posted something on Twitter that that's what they were reading. And I looked into it. It looked like a good read from James Andrew Miller, who also wrote Live from New York, which is kind of the, the go-to standard about SNL. And then also Those Guys Have All the Fun, which is about ESPN. But the way that it's written is very cool. It's interview style, kind of chronological. Um, so it's not a lot of uh, notes from the editor. And I thought you, you could probably stop and like you don't have to finish every chapter to find a good stopping place. Nope. And it doesn't it seem like the author is really looking to put out a bunch of lessons or direct the story. Uh, and oftentimes there are multiple people talking about different topics, or sorry, multiple people talking about the same topic that have a totally different insight of who is responsible for what and who should be given credit for what. Um, but overall, it's a really cool book because uh, they started out as five agents and took on um, the, their major competitor, which they left, uh, which at the time was the standard. And just by being smart and looking at opportunities that were new and being aggressive, uh, they became CAA, which is the powerhouse now. So definitely nice. worth a read, easy to read. Um, all right, so moving on to our tech tip, I wanted to discuss something we really started utilizing um, a couple of months ago, and that's Rike, where I think you have to have probably over 10 employees before you think about doing this. But one thing we learned pretty pretty quickly is you have to find a way to get out of email when it comes to work orders and client requests. And you know, there's no way to quantify this, but I really do think as far as the amount of money on efficiency that we've saved since we moved over to the product. And, you know, this is not a, a recommendation for Rike or a paid sponsorship, but it really has been a great tool for us. I know from the account management side, when you have seven, eight, nine different requests coming in per day from different clients, just to juggle all those things. It also has a time tracker in it. So if you want designers to track their time, but everything, I think at the end of the day, you agree and you brought on Salesforce really early on in our company, but you got to find a way to put everything in one stop shop, one place that you could find everything. And it's been great to get out of email uh, with Reich. Yeah, when you have multiple projects going on, if you don't have a project management yeah, tool, it exactly. gets very confusing very quickly Google because Sheets you're looking work, through email you know. chains. Um, so yeah, Reich has been really great. Looking forward to seeing if there's some ways to incorporate with Salesforce. Salesforce is great for sales. It's a good CMS to have all the contact yep. information in there. Uh, but when we came down to it, it wasn't very good at project management. Uh, so Reich has been really cool. Um, for me, the tech tip is Cirrus Insight, yeah. which is a plugin for different email clients that also syncs to Salesforce. Um, but it was really helpful to get something into my inbox where I could, at the end of the day, um, fire off a bunch of emails that would go out early the next morning. 
um, just because I didn't want to email. And we somebody used to on use the, Gmail. Used to have an app called Boomerang. We used to use Boomerang. Um, we started with, and you can you can queue up emails essentially. Yep. So that's one of the features. I think even Outlook has that, but that really helped when we were sending a lot of emails where, you know, maybe at the end of the evening, I wanted to draft 15 quick emails, but didn't want to hit people up at 11, 12 p.m. on yeah. the East Coast, yep. uh, be able to fire those up. Um, and then there's a lot of sync between uh, Cirrus and Salesforce, so I can create opportunities as soon as they come into my inbox. Um, and just being able to... Similarly with Reich, trying to get things out of the inbox or when they come in, yeah. immediately get them somewhere where they're easy to track. And then with Salesforce is able, you, you, essentially you can go back to any client anytime and see like the date stamp and open up the emails. Yep. So as long yeah. as you're synced to it, you can go back to anyone in particular by their email address. You can see all the communication you've ever had. Um, and that's really helpful when you're just doing a quick scroll through. If somebody gives you a call, you can look back and see all the recent conversations you've had so that you're on the same page. Very cool. Um, moving on to our current business goal for me, and it's been big on the account side, but just continue to build out the training for other departments. You know, we have a, a video department now, Facebook live, uh, department with the, the great producer Mike here, but just trying to, uh, and one thing you, you mentioned too early on was like, you know, if you sit there and have to teach somebody something over and over again, make a training video, especially yep. in, in our industry where everything is pretty much built on the laptop. Um, if you're teaching someone how to use Reich or Sirius Insight or Gmail or Salesforce, you should be able to voice over a training video and show right. somebody very easily. And that's how what you and I, in the beginning of our company, how we learned how to do Photoshop was YouTube tutorials. Right, and that could have been us projecting on everybody, but the way that I think people in our age bracket oh, like sure. to learn is not with someone hovering over nope. our shoulder, but um, being able to watch a video, try it a few times, knowing that that resource is available once you forget because you and will. And this took a while, I feel like, because you and I knew from the outset, like, wow, it's so nice to watch this YouTube tutorial and learn how to cut somebody out in Photoshop. It took a while for us to actually implement that internally. But um, the thing about even w back in the day with the Photoshop, you would forget, like, what was that tool again? And you go right. back to the video and watch it again or fast forward to the part. So if you make a video internally about a process or a workflow, those employees always have the opportunity to, instead of saying, hey, Brett, how do you do this again? They just go straight to the video. It avoids the got a minute questions. Sure. And that's something where it's important as a as an owner and an employer to set people up for success. Yeah. If you give everybody the tools they need to be successful and, they still and then aren't. it doesn't work out, yeah. then it's a problem. But um, for the most part, if you have a good gut instinct about somebody, you give them all the tools they need to be able to succeed, uh, then there's a lot less room for error and to have a, a quick start and make them valuable immediately. Yep. Um, so my biz business goal is to think bigger in terms of opportunity, what we're capable of, and this is something that spills over into personal life as well. Um, you know, I think you're really only limited by what you think you're capable of doing. Obviously, if you want to go compete with Facebook, that's going to be a challenge that you might not be able to meet. Right. Um, however, when, we, when it comes to opportunities, when it comes to what we're capable of doing, now that we've got a few years under our belt, I, I, I'd like to constantly think about, you know, hey, how can we, you know, make the relationship with this one particular bigger, better for all people involved, uh, do more work for them and find creative ways to um, better our clients experience with SDN. Yeah, I think the good news is too, is, is as you have, you start with your initial clients in the beginning of your company. And we talk about this all the time, how, you know, a client may move on or a point of contact may move on. And if you have a great relationship with that person, and it all went well, when they move on to the new job, they're going to recommend you. We've seen that happen a lot. So I think we've been in business now for what, three and a half years, but I just can't imagine five, six, seven, eight, if you continue the, the white glove service and treating your clients right. with respect and doing what you say you're going to do, you can only imagine it's a pretty small industry at the end of the day and people will know your name and if they know you can get the job done, why wouldn't they come to you first? Sure. And looking back on our initial business model and the projects that we were working on in the first year of our company versus what we're doing yeah, now. That's crazy. Um, well, it's like, it's like a Vine situation all over again to take it back to the beginning of the show. Like if you don't move and you don't, uh, with the industry, you're going to get left behind at the end of the day. So if you don't innovate and continue to find out what the niche is or what you need to provide, then you're going to die. We would have died if we would have kept with the same business model sure. in the first six and months. And you've got to be able to keep up with the industry. I, the industry that we're in specifically moves very quickly. So even just to keep up is a real challenge yeah. that some people you know ignore and want to stay in a certain area. Um, but where we would probably both like to get to is a point where we can look out past what the industry is doing right now right. and be totally set up for something as it comes through. And that's really when you're able to take advantage of a new space. 
All right, so moving on to the work-life balance segment of the show. Um, one thing I do, you know, try to you know work out, you know, four to five times a week. But I, I instead of listening to music as of late, listening to podcasting, and hopefully some people can listen to this show on podcast uh, while they work out as well. But really trying to find a way to kill two birds with one stone. If you can get a good workout in physically and also learn a few things mentally, which is how I learned about Reich, was listening to an entrepreneur show, and they were interviewing a, an agency out in L.A., and the guy recommended it. I looked it up. All of a sudden, we're implementing it internally. But, um, you know, I'm a big guy on efficiency, probably to a fault, but I do like killing two birds with one stone, and that's a pretty cool way to, you know, learn on both sides of it. Sounds like a lot of work and not much uh, personal <laughs> I know, right? There. That's um, my first... Uh, First go-to. Yeah, so for me, something that I've learned... But wait, to go back on that, it just made me think about this. Like, if you do what you love, it doesn't... You know what I'm saying? Like, it doesn't feel like, oh my God, I'm back on the nine to five. Like, yeah, if I was a trash man, like, I wouldn't want to be thinking about ways that I can get better for the job. But, you know, I've, I've set myself up where I really do enjoy this working environment. I really do enjoy working with you. I really do enjoy building this company and seeing it grow. So if I can find something that helps that ultimate goal or helps that vision or that passion I have already, yeah. it doesn't feel like, oh, David, you need to be doing something totally mindless. So sure. that's that's a difference too. Agreed. Um, the tip for work-life balance for me is schedule things in your personal life. So if there's something that you want to accomplish personally, if you need to spend time with relatives, loved ones, I felt whatever. bad about this. I sent my dad like a breakfast, like Google Calendar invite for 8 a.m. Like, well, and it seems so like you're going to forget about it otherwise. <laughs> I know, but he had to like uh, he had. I think he approved it, and there was like a GPS address so he can like get to the location of the breakfast. But yeah, I mean, especially as you get busier, if you don't do that, and well, we started realizing work. pretty early on if we had if we needed to speak about something specifically and we didn't put a calendar invite, then every week or so we'd be like, oh, hey, we've really got to. Yeah. So now just setting aside the time and saying this is the time, and it sounds weak, but <laughs> even if you say like, hey, date night on Wednesday, oh, we're yeah. going to go to this restaurant yeah. at this time, uh, it's a lot easier to not get home and just feel like, man, that was a long day. I don't want to do it. Schedule the stuff in. It's always important, and um, it's not just for other people. If you really want to run a race right. or you really right. want to go to a museum, Put the stuff in your calendar. Go and do it on those days. And are you, are you trying to you get better like at this? I think you woke up and made a decision to run a marathon within hours. So you obviously didn't calendar that puppy out. I am trying to get better at it. Um, <laughs> it's But that's like one of my biggest struggles is for personal life. When it comes to work, if I get a telephone call at home, I think like, well, I got to take this call. Um, so there's not a lot of work-life balance on that. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing as long as it goes both ways. Mm -hmm. So... You know, I don't think it's fair to say like, oh, if my wife calls me during work, that's not allowed because it's work time. But then at home, I say, well, I got to take this work call. Just like when even you call it's home me. Time. Yeah. yeah. So it goes both ways. If your dad calls you, you know, right now, this second, you're probably not going to pick it up. You'll call him back. Yeah, you're exactly. not going to think like, hey, I'm at work. Yeah. I can't talk to you right now. Yeah. Um, so the work-life balance, there's really no such thing anymore. There's Especially, a balance, but like you said, there's no such thing as like, I'm going to cut it off at 5 p.m. I'm done. Right. I'm never touching you, anything Yeah, you can't yet. say, yeah. From, at, least, from, at least if a business owner or entrepreneur's perspective. Right. So from 9 to 5, you don't do anything at all for home life. And then from 5 to there's 9, no you don't yeah. do anything for work. There's no way. It doesn't make sense. So um, basically just being able to combine the two and do it all. All right. As always, we want to move on to the media spotlight. I'll throw it to you. Uh, what would you uh, want to spotlight this week? So I wanted to spotlight. I wanted to go back to the Tesla video just so that the people out there can take a look at the roof. Um, I was really impressed by this. I really think Elon Musk is doing some pretty amazing things. So, uh, Mike, if we can cue up the video of the roof, if we have it, just so that everybody out there can see that it really is good looking and uh, you'll see them a lot in neighborhoods coming soon. And this is the, I mentioned this earlier in the show, but I'm pretty sure that the... Uh, is there a couple of Teslas there in the, uh, oh, of course. <laughs> in the garage? Uh, and those are Tesla batteries inside of the garage. But this was filmed, I believe, on the set of uh, Desperate Housewives that still exists somewhere so. in Hollywood. Um, but the tiles feed into these battery packs that have been around for a while. But oh, wait, so your roof essentially is charging your car. The roof is charging the entire home in certain circumstances. And the car, So though, those too. batteries of those size can power like oh, the entire I see. home. Gotcha. Um, so there you got Elon. It, he has put on a little bit of weight. Looks like he's been working hard. <laughs> it's a little bigger than last time I saw him. That's but awesome. Yeah, inspirational guy. Cool product. Good to see. Uh, for me, Media Spotlight, I saw an interview on The Breakfast Club with Kevin Hart. It's a radio show out in New York, and they have a pretty good YouTube following. But watch the entire thing, and I'm going to show you just a little clip to give you some context before I jump into it. Really, the, the uprise. This is when you do more mm -hmm. so you can go and say, okay, oh, wow, yeah. I stood alone. 
You keep it a lot of stuff out though. The commercials, the TV shows, the stand up specials. Yeah, you you out here, bro. This ain't working. Like, <laughs> what now? What now is gonna drop? That's my next stand up special. I can't wait to see that one. They only come out you every it. two and a half <laughs> years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Think about yeah, it. It's, yeah. A two, it's a two and a half break yeah. between all my stand up specials. Mm -hmm. uh, animation, Secret Life of Pets. This is my first animation. You're movie. a little white bunny rabbit? I'm a little white bunny <laughs> rabbit. I'm a little <laughs> white <laughs> militant bunny rabbit, okay? At the Secret Life of Pets, I got another animation that's gonna come out, I think, in 2018, Captain Underpants. I got a book now that I wrote, which is simply my life, right, me good, opening Mike. up about um, So essentially, I, I counted everything he's doing in 2016. He has Central Intelligence movie coming out, What Now Comedy Special coming out, first non-athlete to be signed by Nike and have his own shoe, an animation, a book, launching a comedian network, filming Jumanji, Untouchables drama with Brian Cranston, and shooting season five of Real Husbands of Hollywood, and that's not all of it. Um, and just from an entrepreneur standpoint, that's inspiring to me for someone that big. Kevin Hart could just tour and make millions of dollars as just a stand-up comedian, but he's sure. parlaying that success into a movie star. Into right, and then he could just be a movie star and a comedian. You're good. Stop. No, he's going to write a book. He's going to launch a comedian or a comedy network. He's going to do an animation instead of just doing featured films. So um, that kind of woke me up a little bit because I feel like you know we're doing great as a company, but like you mentioned, to think bigger, diversify your income, and find different ways. That you can use your intelligence and your, you know, um, your intellect to move in so many different directions. That you know, if one of the things happens to fall, not this entire business, but if one of your passions happen to fall, you got 19 other things to fall back on. Sure, and he's probably looking out into the future when he doesn't want to be on stage exactly. that many nights out of the week, and he doesn't want to mm -hmm. be on set all the time, so that he can set up a essentially a studio or a conglomerate yep. where he's got multiple entertainment channels that he doesn't. And have this to recent stand-up special he did, he. He uh, fronted the whole thing, so he shot the whole thing, hired the director, so it wasn't like he had to get Universal Studios to do the whole thing. He uh, he owned it that way. You get a bigger piece of the pie at the at the box office as well. Yeah, he's he's in there, in my opinion, with the uh, Ryan Seacrest. Yeah, and um, I mean Seacrest parlayed his you know Kiss FM career into uh, Keep It Up with the Kardashians. Yeah, like, that's an EP. That's Simon crazy. Simon Cowell. When you yeah. look at you know Scooter Braun, uh, when you look at what these guys are accomplishing, it's really impressive that they've got their fingers in so many pies, and all of them are doing successful independently. Yeah. So okay. So moving on to Q and A here towards the end of the show. Um, I wanted this. A lot of people have emailed me uh, that that have met me and asked for advice. And the number one thing is really how to stand out in the crowded environment with your resumes, people graduating college, things like that. And I think we had a, an interesting thing um, this last week with with an applicant, but just the art of following up. I think too many people send the email and think, that's it. I hope they answer. Um, and we actually did something recently. I don't know if you're going to sp speak about that, but where you hit up a prospect and we went back and looked at how many times you followed up, followed up, followed up, followed up, set a time, they missed the meeting, all those different things. And before you know it, it's a string of 28. And it doesn't seem like it's you're being badgering. You're just following up as as somebody that wants to, to meet with them. So I think the same way when it comes to um, people coming out of college or prospective employees, it's if somebody emails me, you know, four times over the course of a six week period, I'm gonna be like, all right, I'm gonna do this person justice and email them back. They deserve it at this point. Sure. And so I think anybody that shows that will, that hunger, even in your email inbox, you automatically give them a little bit more respect and you're much more likely to respond yeah. to them. And believe me, no one that's important is going to be shocked or outraged that you've emailed them a bunch of times. In most cases, when I've emailed somebody over and over and over and over and over, yeah. the first email that they finally send sorry. back is like, I'm really sorry, I've been really busy. And then it's either I'm not interested at all or hey, let's find a time in the next few weeks. So uh, unless you're emailing every, you know, every single day yeah, or something so really overboard, but if you need to get in touch with somebody, email them directly and continue following up until you get some sort of answer one way or the other. Every 40 or 72 hours, like, hey, just wanted to follow right. up. I know you're probably, you know. That's and and our it, early in our company, it felt a little uncomfortable because I didn't want to be the pest that was emailing everybody all the time. Um, and I think that we read an article somewhere that basically said, go with the assumption that if they haven't responded, that they, they didn't read even it. read they, they didn't, didn't, they read didn't it. open it. Yeah. it. Assume that it went to their spam or that they scrolled right through and didn't even look at it. So your fifth email is basically your first email because they've never read any of the others. Um, so yeah, being persistent. I yeah, think if, you, if you're going, if you're trying to go after, you know, the director of digital at Fox television, that person probably has a lot of stuff going on. So the, the vendor that's hitting them up to hop on a call is not number one on their list and they probably either read it and forget about it or like you right. said, they just archive it immediately. So yeah. when you follow up the third time, that's when you got them at a perfect time where 
they happen to be sitting down, your email popped up, I, I'm going to give this guy a chance. So. Sure. And some personalities lend themselves to that a little bit better. But if you are shy, that's something where it's a good exercise to just get over it. You don't have to do it in person. Send those emails, follow up. Um, you know, it, it makes a big difference. And you have to find working. that balance. But I think you've mentioned before, like, you know, what's the alternative? If they already hate you and they're not going to work with you, then you can at least continue to follow up and at least know, like, there's no way I could have worked with that person because they told me no. But if you never get a no, right? then what's the alternative? You're and not going to work with them anyway. And if you're on the job hunt, a lot of people will, which makes sense, but they'll apply to 15 or 20 different places with That's one application thing, onto the website or one Gener email a through. generic email too. But I really feel like you'd be better off choosing the two places you really want to go and sending well, seven and, or 10 emails to those two places. One thing we started doing with um, you know job descriptions is at the very end saying, give me you know your ultimate goal, dream job, your dream or, yeah. job or your ultimate goal in life. And we get 90 applicants and three people answered the question. So not only out of those 90, only three people either read it or followed directions. Everybody else is just mass sending it sure. and hoping it's a numbers game. Like I'll apply to 50 jobs and one of them will hire me. But if you take the time to personalize each and every one, instead of hitting up 90 job opportunities, hit up four or five and make it personal and research the the guy or the owner on LinkedIn or whatever you got to do to make it personal. Cause when I read those like, Hey, I followed you guys, your website's really cool. Right. I think you guys are doing really cool things. It'd be great. You know, I live down the street based on your address location, like all those things. I'm like, I'm going to give this right. person. And a it chance. makes, it really makes you feel like they want this job, not just a job. Exactly. Absolutely. Um, so my piece of advice is from something that happened personally, but it's um, if somebody asks you for a favor, try and do it. If you've got the time, do it. So I had a client who gave me a request to give them a recommendation on LinkedIn. And I really wanted to. And I followed up and I said, hey, you know, happy to do it. Is there anything specifically, you know, out of your many skills, what are the particular ones on, that you're yeah. looking to focus on? And this person got back to me and said, hey, anything is fine. Like, thanks so much. And I never got around to it. And not that it was a quid, uh, quid pro quo type situation, but that person wound up being in a new position that would have been really helpful and we still work together now. But um, I looked back at it and thought like, you know, I really should have just taken the time out to do a personal favor for someone because it can be really meaningful and it really only takes a few minutes of your time. Right. So you talk all the time about certain mentors that you reached out to early in your journalism career right. and they gave tons of advice and it was really helpful. Um, so if you have the opportunity to be lucky enough to where someone looks up to you at all, yeah. take the time, give them five minutes, hop on a telephone call, uh, give them a recommendation, uh, because it's usually a little tiny bit of effort on your part, and it means a lot to the other person. All right, so to wrap it all up here on Entrepreneur Wrap, the quote of the week. So quote of the week for me, this is a couple variations, but I really liked it. I went to a talk recently. It was about venture capital in the health sciences or life sciences arena, which I don't know much about. Um, but one of the quotes that somebody said was um, a quote from World War II, one of the generals kind of as a joke said, when in doubt, win the war. So if a soldier at any point in time didn't know what to do, kind of as a joke, when in doubt, win the war, which is obvious. And uh, this guy had been an executive at Amgen, which I didn't know anything about, but is a huge billion dollar um, life sciences company and they transitioned that to when in doubt do what's best for the patient and he had a couple stories about you know when they were working on huge projects with tons of money on the line and there was even the slightest chance that it could have been harmful or for whatever reason not best for the patient that was always their rubric of determining whether to go forward with something mm -hmm. um, so I've thought a lot about that quote and you know in our business model maybe to go with when in doubt do what's best for the client sometimes it's very clear that hey this person is asking for something that's totally not part of the deal um, but moving forward and kind of looking at those experiences that I discussed earlier in the show when somebody had a couple issues um, to give our team that understanding of when in doubt do what's best for the client if it's a gray area I would rather it go to the client's favor than in our favor and then if it really becomes an issue it's something that we can address but i really liked that quote and that had me thinking a lot very cool uh so two quotes for you number one surround yourself with like-minded people who force you to level up i think that's one thing i'm going to focus on in the next you know a few months is really to uh, make new relationships uh here in san diego and and try to you know surround myself with more people that i look up to or people that are in situations that i want to be in because i think that's uh that's infectious, man. I think if some guy that's 
you know, 22 years old, smoking weed, all of a sudden started hanging out with four neurosurgeons, probably make him level up a little bit and then try to reevaluate what he's doing with his life. So I think anytime you're in a situation, try to hang out with people in places that you want to be in the future. So even if you get right out of college and you want to be, you know, whatever you want to be, try to go out there and reach out to those people that are already in those positions, get advice and be able to learn from them. And then, um, my second one is becoming the hardest working person, you know, at the end of the day, um, if that's, if that's your rubric, then you're going to be in a good place. So out of everybody, you know, you should be the hardest working person. If you are, you'll go, uh, you'll go pretty far in this life. Yeah, I agree. Um, what was the first one again? Sorry. <laughs> Surround yourself with like-minded right. people who force you to level up. Yeah. Something that you mentioned there, uh, is something I thought about recently. So oftentimes people will look at like what somebody does as, you know, whether they want to be like them or not. And I also think it's really important to balance that with how a person lives their life and how they are. If you said, all right, this guy's got a shitload of money, but they're totally miserable. Of course. That's probably not the guy you want to go after. Um, but even just looking at, you know, the run I did this weekend, for the most part, I feel like runners are generally happy. And that's one of the reasons why I kind of look at that group and say like, ah, it seems to be working for most of these people. So checking it out. Um, so when you're looking for people to model yourself after, look at a, you know, the types of things that you want to do that would make you, you know, happy. But at the same time, look at the people who are happy. Look at the people who are living like an awesome life, the type of life that you'd want to live across but the board. Yeah, if, you, if every Wednesday you had a dinner with, you know, Simon Cowell, Mark Cuban and Elon Musk, I think every time you got away from that dinner, like, I need to, I need to continue to push, man. I need right. to get where these guys are at. So that's the point is like, you know, wherever you want to be in life and anybody that you aspire to be, I think the more you can hang out with like-minded individuals, then I think the, the faster you'll get there. Copy. There it is. Entrepreneurs wrap on Facebook Live and, of course, uh, iTunes for the first time. Brett Regan, David Griffin.